Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, I should say up front that a casualty of the digital age has been my wristwatch. So if you see me looking at my phone periodically, it's just because I'm checking how the time is progressing. I'm not texting people <laughs> while we have a panel. Um, so first of all, let me just introduce our fantastic panel. Um, this is Mark Kingwell. Mark is a professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto and a contributing editor to Harper's Magazine. Among his many, many books of political and cultural theory are multiple national bestsellers. His most recent book is the essay collection Unruly Voices. And next to him is Sarah Grimes. Sarah is a professor with the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto and associate director of the Semaphore Lab, which is a fantastic name for a lab. Her re research explores the cultural politics of children's media and digital games, as well as the political economies of social technologies. And finally, Johanna Schneller is one of North America's leading freelance journalists specializing in entertainment features. She's profiled the most prominent actors of our time, and her cover stories have appeared in a variety of major magazines. She writes the weekly Fame Game column uh, in the Globe and Mail. So welcome to you all. Looking forward to your thoughts. So this isn't a book report that we're doing here. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 is sort of a jumping off point for a cultural discussion. But just if you haven't read the book, just to give you a really quick synopsis, uh, Guy Montag is a fireman in a future world where books are banned and the fireman's job is to burn them where they are found along with the houses of the people who have them. But in fact, most people don't want books. They're very happy looking at these giant customized video screens of entertainment or listening to audio all the time on seashells. Books are considered destructive because they encourage thinking, seriousness, and can lead to sadness. Tonight we're going to look at uh, whether that vision of the future reflects our reality, and in particular whether the culture of 24-7 media access is destructive of deeper thought, deeper relationships, and a deeper understanding of the self. So let's jump in, shall we? So the book imagines this future where books are banned, but I think more importantly, basically no one's interested in reading books, or very few people are, uh, and they're not really interested in what you might consider rigorous thinking. So how reflective do you think that is of our current uh, situation? Johanna, would you like to kick it off? Uh, well, I spent today uh, reading Fahrenheit 451, which I hadn't read since high school, and joining Twitter which I think is kind of a good <laughs> thing to do. Um, and keeping one honest with, I'm not going to say which. Um, but I did find <laughs> and just about every hour, I had to get up and see how many more Twitter followers were following me <laughs> because I got very you know, uh, invested egomaniacally in how many people were, were not following me. Um, and so I realized like, to keep the concentration on the book, it's so interesting because people are so used to wanting to feel connected at all times. And I think this is what it comes down to. It, people following me in real time felt like I was with other people. The book, you're reading it by yourself. Even though we're all reading it together, there is that kind of feeling of connectedness versus isolation. And I think maybe we haven't really reached the point where we want to ban books, but I think we might be reaching the point where we're terrified of doing anything in isolation. Hmm. That's my opening salvo. Sarah. <laughs> Wow, really, yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I want to talk more about that. Um, I think that there's a bunch of different things going on. Definitely the always on and always available media can be very distracting and certainly uh, in my own life and speaking to my students, it has been a, a big source of distraction. Of course, there's a number of people who are quite interested in how this shift towards multitasking, you know, and thinking of it not as, much in terms of a distracted state, but as a multitasking kind of multiply engaged state is, is compelling, it's interesting. Um, I hope that uh, that is successful at some point because that's certainly not um, how I experience uh, being able to learn and being able to accomplish tasks myself, um, but that there's promise there is, is interesting and compelling. Um, you know, in terms of how that disrupts deep thought, though, I, I'm really, I, I don't completely think that <clears throat> it only serves it as, as a distracting function because certainly the access to information, the ability to go deeper and to do research and the opening up of that type of information and access to learning new things, learning how to do things, finding out how to make something or finding out how to research something, as well as engaging with other people in that process is also happening through social media in particular, different internet kinds of technologies, and that's enabling all kinds of citizen research, citizen innovation and invention, as well as a sharing of those things. So 
I, I guess it really depends on, on the context. Mark, the culture of the book? Uh, yeah, I, I, is this the moment to say that Fahrenheit 451 is not a very good book? Now we've got everyone in the room. I know, and, I, and I, you know, I wasn't party to the decision to make it the keynote book for this uh, series of, of very important cultural events. Um, but uh, since it's raining, I'm going to rain on the parade. It's, it's not a good book. And what's interesting about that is that the freedom to say that a book with a good idea is, in fact, not a good book mm. is a complicated kind of intellectual freedom, which I think may be more and more in danger of leaving us. Because it's, it's to hold two different ideas in mind at once. Important idea, bad execution. Uh, I, I'm putting it crudely, but um, it's, it's a subtlety of mind which uh, only certain kinds of media and only certain kinds of reflection actually allow us to embrace and, and think through. Uh, so I was struck by reading the book for the first time since high school, uh, A, by the fact that aesthetically it's, it's unaccomplished, uh, but B, uh, it has this really interesting character, which is not Guy Montag, the fireman, uh, but the fire chief who he sorry, spoiler alert, who he kills. <laughs> um, he immolates at, at a certain stage in the book. Sorry, I'm not sorry. I, it's, um, and he plays the role that, that uh, O'Brien plays in, in uh, Orwell's 1984, or Mustafa Mon plays in Huxley's Brave New World. He's, he's what happens to intellectuals in a dystopian future. Mm. They become cynical to a degree that, that we can barely imagine, even in our own age. Uh, and I think that's an interesting moment that, that um, Intellectual energy might be bent to the, uh, the underlying ideology of a dominant social system in a way that isn't innocent, but in fact is complicit. Hmm. And that's the one, the one thing that I think we should take away from this book. And I, I do want to make it relevant to today that um, what, what we're witnessing now is not so much this kind of distraction. Of course, that's there. But it's our own complicity with it that I think is most interesting that uh, to follow through on the, the Twitter thing. I have a Twitter account and I've never tweeted. And, um, and I'm, I'm like Johanna, I'm, I'm sort of curious to see how many followers I can get without ever once tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you who are on Twitter, please become my followers because, uh, and I, I promise never to break the silence, I will be the Bartleby the Scrivener of tweeting. Uh, I would prefer not to tweet. And my silence will become a work of art over time. Really? If you and tweet me, I'll tweet you back. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so, I mean, the question beyond the issue of distractibility, there's that question of like, is there something about the book as a linear form, like as, a, as that type of narrative that gives it some kind of special currency beyond our ability to get it, information? From I, don't, I don't think it's the linearity. Sources. I think Johanna had it um, uh, right. It's the isolation. It's the, the willingness to be alone and to, to sign yourself to the world as alone. Right? That's the intimacy that's peculiar to this medium, which is the thoughts of some other person rendered into a text, which you then ingest or spend time with, and you don't engage with anything else in the world while you're doing that. That's what makes the book the book. It's not linearity or even extended argument. It's that isolation. And I, I guess, I mean, for better or worse, I mean, we can talk about the better and the worse, but for better or worse, people just don't seem willing to so isolate as time goes on. Well, I think that there's ways, you know, I, I, it's the only way that I can explain to myself the phenomenon of Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a really execrable book and the <laughs> worst written book ever in the history of the world. And, and yet, and yet, you know, it's on every bestseller list and people are reading it like crazy and they're making a movie. So, so it's obviously not about the quality, right? Um, you can't really say, is the book dead? Because people buy books all the time. It's, it's, it's our discernment about what's good also fading a little bit. Like, is it more important to be part of something where you're buying the same book that everybody else is buying at the same time than it is to actually have any sort of, it seems to me that what we're, what we're, willing to do, and this is the first step, I think Bradbury was a little more prescient than you give him credit for, but the sort of the first step in the, in the dumbing down of everything was the idea that there is no such thing as good and bad or high and low, that people stopped being discerning. 
And the minute you stop being able to say this is good or this is bad and you have to accept everything, then I think you get yourself into a little bit of trouble. Sorry, just to, to um, for the record, <laughs> it's not the prescience that I think yeah. he's wrong about. It's, yeah. it's the actual execution of no, 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 the, no, I know. the I characterization, know. the dialogue. I guess know. I just mean I give it more credit for being prescient, even sure. though the writing is... Yeah, I mean, you know, look, it's great. It's still in print. It's, you know, <laughs> buy copies, buy copies. Tell his estate that they need more money. Send it to them. It's all good. <laughs> Sarah, you, you study um, children's cultural practices around technology. Do you find that they're still, uh, I don't know if this is specifically with your research, but th that they're still open to that kind of solitary experience of the book? Or is their very nature with the world so much more social and connected? Yeah, I mean, I guess there are a lot of different examples where kids and adults spend <coughs> solitary kind of moments with different media. It's not just a book thing, right? I mean, people watch movies on their own and television and play video games on their own. and in terms of being just you in the text, this is this is pretty. It's pretty common. I, I wouldn't isolate that to just the book. Maybe there's something special about that relationship that some people have with certain books. But the the soloness definitely happens a lot. Um, kids spend a lot of time alone, more time than most of them would like, uh, and that striving to connect and finding ways to connect through different devices and different kinds of technologized, mediated contexts is often comes from actually feeling like they have too much time alone and too much time in, in isolation, at least among you know, middle class kids who are only children and, and living in an area where you're not allowed to go play outside and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it's, um, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with, with this kind of characterization of either the connectedness or uh, the, uh, the identification of books as the one moment that we have to enjoy media on our own. Well, I, again, I feel like I'm now correcting the things that I said before, but um, <laughs> it's not the soloness that's important. It's the communion with one other person's mind. It's the consciousness of consciousness that is, I think, unique to the book. I don't think there's another medium that comes close, and that, so the, the film, video, video game thing doesn't answer that point. It's that these are the thoughts of one other person, and you are one person, and this is a mystery that we have consciousness in this form of personhood. And uh, I can tell you from, you know, my report from the cutting edge of philosophy, there is such a thing, trust me. Uh, we don't understand personhood. We don't understand consciousness. It's an enduring problem. And there is no medium in the history of human civilization that has made the problem more vivid than the book. Uh, and I mean that as specifically the technology. I think you can offload the technology to other kinds of delivery systems. I don't mean video games, but say Kindles or what, whatnot. But even that is, is a different thing. Better or worse, again, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, but the choice, for example, of which book to take with you when you go on a trip, you can take every book there is, then you've eliminated the problem of making that choice. And the problem of making that choice is a choice of consciousness. It's a choice about what it means to be a self. And so if you take that out of the equation, we've changed the nature of consciousness. Now, um, I, you know, I... I I knew that I, this would happen. Uh, <laughs> I said when we did the pre-interview last week, I would be cast as the curmudgeon. And, uh, and I, I have perhaps cast myself that way. Um, is, is there anybody else in the room who has never owned a cell phone? Awesome. You are my people. <laughs> yes. I don't think that that's so important, except that it's a flight from this, this constant availability. I'm a private person. My consciousness is my own. I will share it with others when and if I choose. You can't reach me 24 hours a day. But this is... This is something this that comes up in the... <laughs> right audience. The live people are your people. This is one of the things that really does come up in the book, in Fahrenheit 451, beyond the culture of the book in particular, is that the people just fill every opportunity for silence or space with whatever they have these you know giant video screens but they also do things like drive their cars really fast there's no um there's no space for reflection and um, that in particular beyond the culture of the books was something that really resonated with me is because i think that we do that and i think that experience is becoming more and more common where there's just this part of your brain that's going is anything happening on my phone or whatever and it, which is partly about distraction but it is partly the consequence of filling up your life and the, the mental space in your environment. Well, it's this, um, you know, I am seen, therefore I am. 
thing. I think we are changing the definition of, of what we want um, other people's responses to be. I think it's, you know, the, even the language of Twitter, you know, follow me, is, is very, um, you know, I, I used to live in LA and when you'd park your car, you'd walk in and, and they would stamp your ticket and you would say, can you validate me? And, uh, and <laughs> I thought that was so apt for LA because everybody's just walking around going, can you, val do you validate? I'll validate, I'll validate me. Please validate me. And, and so all day long, I kept thinking, please validate me. Please, please see me. Please acknowledge that I am here. And, um, I think all of that, the reality TV stars and, and uh, people's hunger for being seen has to be coming from somewhere, I think. And it's not just the desire to be famous, I don't think. I think there must be something in this technology that, that creates a need. It's like if you get a, a catalog in the mail from LLB and you suddenly really need boots and you didn't need them five <laughs> minutes ago. Um, and I think it must be the same thing. I think that the maybe you know not having a cell phone or or not having an ipod or whatever is the only way to protect yourself from this thing that gets created in you instantaneously don't you think uh it's i mean it's interesting thinking of before this not democratization exactly because it's not but more widespread access to the ability to present self in a mass media kind of a form and all those years of being so exposed to celebrity culture and <laughs> this idea of elites and this idea of what was important and who was important and this kind of almost like a build-up need of being part of that and saying we're here too. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very curious about that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, of course, it, it's a point worth making that, that this is actually not new, you know. Uh, I was reading, just to take a proximate example, I was reading today Dwight MacDonald, a uh, great cultural critic from the middle part of the last century, and he was writing in 1957 uh, about what he called the tyranny of facts. And he said the only rescue from the American tyranny of facts was a kind of flight from this constant overexposure to news, the news cycle, the having to know things, the having to keep up with things. It's 1957, you know, before the internet, uh, before I was born, before I'm sure some of us, uh, others were born. Um, so the, this, the, the novelty that we tend to put on our current situation is itself something that's worth querying. Uh, people have of, often felt this overwhelming sense of uh, having to keep up. And they've often, if not always, in the modern era anyway, felt this idea that somehow uh, as individuals they need to assert themselves or they, they have to um, be present, you know, they have to be recognized. Uh, I mean, the fact is, the, the sad fact is, we're not nearly as important as we think we are. <laughs> and uh, we keep trying to convince ourselves otherwise. Uh, and one of the ways we do this is by saying, you know, I have this many friends, I have this many followers. Uh, this is just a new kind of twist on a very old desire. Uh, I'm, I was thinking the other day also of um, Jennifer Egan's novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, the last part of which I think is a brilliant piece of dystopian fiction, uh, which depicts a very near future where people can no longer communicate face to face like we're doing. I mean, we're in this artificial way. Uh, they can only, they can only, they would rather text face to face because they can do it more efficiently and, and they can get their meaning clearer that way. And I thought, well, that's what the future looks like. It's the, the same future that the, the earlier past looked to us. We are always trying to communicate who we are as clearly as we think mm -hmm. we want to. Mm -hmm. And the technology is, is uh, far less important than that desire. But the desire is, is doomed to failure because we will never be able to show to somebody else exactly who we are. The world will not ever recognize exactly who we are. Yeah, that's what the present looks like in Jennifer Egan's book, because yeah. I, I have a 20 year old daughter and I've watched her exchange 17 texts with people for one thing, like, are we meeting here or here? And I said to her, Haley, you know, if you pick up the phone, you can actually <laughs> do this in one second. And they won't because it's too intimate. Yeah. There's too much interaction right. in that. And, and she said, mom, we only we save phone calls for like only really important things. If I called them up, it would be inappropriate. Yeah. And, and this is where we are. I have to say the one thing, the one boon as a teacher, I don't know, Sarah, if you've had this experience, used to drive me crazy in, in my lectures when, when students' cell phones went off, when they rang. Mm. They never ring anymore because they're just texting. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I, I can't stop them talking to each other, but at least they no longer ring. 
But so, um, you know, when uh, Bradbury was writing in uh, the early 50s, I mean, he was partly critiquing the society of his day, obviously, as science fiction writers do, and in particular, critiquing mass media, right? Critiquing the rise of television as the dominant common cultural language. But we don't necessarily live in that world anymore. We live in the world of, you know, the long tail of the internet and, and specific niche cultures. And this dual nature of, on the one hand, being able to connect to people uh, all over the world over very specific interests, but at the same time, we run the risk of living in these little echo chambers of self-regard. So does it make a difference now that we're the, the dominant culture is now internet culture, which facilitates this ability for more niche connections, rather than this mass culture? What difference does that make? Sarah? <laughs> um, Yes, it's sort of like that, but it's not fully like that, right? It's, we don't fully have access. We're not really seeing a huge diversity of voices. There's still such a push to reestablish the mass media, um, the very industries that became dominant across different media platforms are very actively trying to make sure that they maintain a lot of control. And in terms of where people are going and how they find things, you know, a lot of these Web 2.0 kinds of sites like Facebook, they're all like funnels kind of pushing people back towards the same places. So all of those possibilities are maybe out there, but in terms of encountering them, it's, it's more than an echo chamber problem. It's not just that you're stuck in your niche. It's that increasingly things are designed, laws are implemented that kind of keep you keep you circulating in the same circles. And in that respect, we're not really even niching ourselves. We're still, we're still very much at least engaging with a, an idea of a mass, I think. You're wading through more layers to get to it, maybe. Like there's you know, the layer of what this little group is doing, then there's the layer of what everybody else is doing, and then, there, you know, and then there's the angst over you know, traditional media or, you know, but, but, I, but you sort of have to be aware of all of that now. It's not just enough. You're not all getting in the Bradbury scenario. You can kind of create your own little family on the screens that appear in your living room. But everybody's pretty much talking about nothing. And his fear was that we would all drown in the talking about nothing. Whereas now I think the fear is that we're all going to drown in talking about too much. I think I, I really like Sarah's point about that. Because I, I think when you look at the way the internet has been monetized, which is what people forget to look at because they think it's just a kind of information commons, which it isn't at all. Uh, it's, it's very constrained and very funneled. And your preferences expressed or simply enacted are constantly being bent back on you so that you, you are the data. I mean, you are being mined constantly, even if it doesn't feel that way. So this kind of refraction effect is actually the most important thing about the way the internet functions. Um, I, I wanted to say I was struck by um, one thing in the book. Um, Fahrenheit 451, you mentioned, Nora, that uh, one of the reasons that people object to books is they make them sad. Uh, and there's this great scene where there's this kind of you know, um, coffee clatch of, of women, Guy's wife and his, her friends, and they, he starts reading to them from Dickens, and they, they cry, and they can't stand it. You know? huh. uh, but the other thing is that when the fire chief comes in at one point, he says, don't you know that all those books disagree with each other? <laughs> you know, don't, don't you know that one says one thing and the other says another thing? And I think that's kind of what's, what's lost about this, too. This, if the refraction effect is correct, and I think it is, we're not getting that disagreement. We're not getting dialectical ideas where you're confronted by something that is completely opposite of what you already believe, that actually says to you, everything you think is right is wrong, and you have to deal with that. You might have to decide maybe to just jettison it, or you, you take it on board and you, you challenge yourself, or you are challenged by it. But instead, if, if the, you know, the refraction is correct, you're just getting what you already believe constantly recycled back in your direction. And I think this is one of the big dangers. Um, David Foster Wallace, the late David Foster Wallace, defined popular culture in general as the symbolic representation of what people already believe. And I think this, this is what we have now, except it's, it's much more sort of, uh, what, personalized or narcissized. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get exactly what you believe constantly coming back to you and coming back to you. So, I mean, that, to, your, to your point, you're absolutely right. But it is possible for, you know, a transgender kid growing up in the middle of nowhere to find people that they otherwise wouldn't be able to find. Or it is possible to find a broader diversity of points of view if you so choose, right? Doesn't that make a difference just in terms of it? It's a good point. And I, I think that that's, you know, one of the things that has been 
um, most interesting is to watch the creation of, of community across distance in that way. Uh, and I mean, the idealized version of this is that it will, will uh, facilitate diversity or, or support. Um, there's so much counter evidence, though. You know, for, for every example like that, there's another example of somebody's preferences being sold back to them because of mm -hmm. what they posted on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, that it, I mean, trivial again, but uh, something that you tweeted in an unguarded moment ruins your career or gets you fired from your job. I mean, these things are, are far more capricious and probably more costly than the benefits of, yeah, I can find my chosen community with this technology. Johanna Mark uh, uh, alluded to celebrity culture, and since this is something that you speak uh, or write eloquently <laughs> about, <laughs> which often gets tarred with the brush of dumbing down the culture, yes. how do you respond to that? Um, well, Mark said his, his role on the panel was to be the curmudgeon, and I think mine is to be the Pollyanna. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've often, in the dark night of the soul, wondered what it is that I do for a living. Am I making things worse or better? I think that the, the on the positive side of pop culture, what it gives people is a kind of a language through which they can connect. I mean, you start talking about what happened on Mad Men last night, and and then hopefully you start to talk about something in your own life with your own friends that, you know, are you, do you take Betty's side or Dawn's side or blah, blah, blah. And then pretty soon you're not talking about them anymore. You're talking about you. And, uh, and I think that there's always been art for that reason. I think that you, you need a kind of um, mediating force before you're really willing to spill your guts. And, 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 and it's a way we, we feel each other out. Um, so in the finding of one another on the internet, people who, you know, with whom you agree, it can have that terrible effect of mirrors looking into mirrors looking into mirrors, but it can also still, I think, provide windows for people um, where connections can be made. I think you have to fight against you know, the internet knowing you're pregnant before you've told all your friends because you looked up cribs or something and then like suddenly. <laughs> um, but I think that it's, it's like all these things, it's not one, it's not only good or only bad. I think it's really up to us how, uh, again, rigorous we are when we use it. How are, are we going to sink in and, and just let it carry us away? Or are we going to try to maintain some separateness from it and use it? Sarah, are there things in um, youth uh, media practices that you find either heartening or, or disheartening in this respect? Yes. Um, well, right now I'm working on a project that's all about things that kids make and share online. So I'm seeing tons of examples of amazing things. Um, there's definitely an influence of not as much celebrity culture, although that's part of it, but maybe like unless Pokemon is a celebrity, which for some people <laughs> they are. Um, but media brands and, and those types of things, as well as very original kinds of creations. And the ability to engage with, I think, the shared vocabulary that you're describing. It's not just about um, being able to talk about what Mad Men look like, but what Mad Men might be. And you know, kind of doing these mashups and sort of the things that fan, fans have been doing with fan fiction for many, many years, and sci-fi fans have been doing in magazines for years before that. Um, so there's an engagement that goes on that's really heartening as well. I mean, you can see the presence of those types of media traces as negative, as an influence, but in terms of the subversion and in terms of the meaning making and problematizing gender representation or remarking that there are no female ninja turtles and so let's create one and, and pretend that there is one and remaking it is, is really interesting. And then the disheartening part of that um, is, I guess for me, is this enclosure of children's ability to talk about these things together and to express themselves publicly about them. So that's kind of like copyright regimes and people going through uh, fan sites and taking down things that are copyright infringement. Um, so the Ninja Turtles don't get to have a girl Ninja Turtle because that doesn't accord with the brand. And this is a, an instance of, of kids appropriating images that they're not allowed to appropriate, which if we're going to think of popular culture as something that is symbolic, it's something that's meaningful, it's something that's being crammed down our throats or however else we want to think about it, our ability to critique and engage is, is probably the most important thing that we have and that we need to protect. Mm. No one was telling us that we couldn't uh, 
critique Rumpelstiltskin or whatever when we were kids, right? Is the, the mm -hmm. common culture is now so commodified <laughs> and locked up with with copyright? Yeah. Yes. If you did, uh, you know, reenact some Disney cartoon in your backyard, Disney didn't come and shut you down, <laughs> <laughs> or it was harder for them to find you. Yeah. <laughs> They probably but that's, way. I mean, is a feature of certainly of the social technologies and social media that we have, which is that people can now radically be more, it's radically easier to share and, and to create content and to riff on content, um, which, you know, informally we probably always did amongst our friends, but now you can have this culture of producing it and sharing it. Because um, I, I, for one, find that exciting. Do you share that or...? Yeah, I'm amazed at the speed of it. You know, I mean, you, Beyonce makes a video and then somebody makes an homage to that and then somebody mocks the homage to that and then somebody does an homage to the mocking of the homage. Like it's, and it's just like, it happens in a day. Yeah. So I do think that there's, you know, there's a lot of creativity around it. I would, I, you know, in a lot of ways, a tweet is a new art form. If you can, if you can do that in 140 characters, it's, it's like a limerick or some other thing that's being invented for us right now. Um, the YouTube video, I think, has endless possibilities about that sort of, suddenly everybody's a filmmaker. Um, it, you know, I don't know if you guys... Uh... I, I, I don't disagree with that, I, uh, because any, any medium is, is a, a mixture of constraint and possibility. That's what a medium is. Uh, but I guess I wonder, uh, wearing my curmudgeon hat, what, what that does to other kinds of media. You know, McLuhan claimed that the advent of new media didn't destroy old media, just enwrap them or you know, encase them, and there was a kind of lines of, of age on a tree, and you could still find, you know, we still find radio uh, when there's television, and we still find television when there's the internet, and we still find books when there's blogging and so on. Um, but that's not actually true. I mean, there, there are media that get destroyed. There are forms of expression that are simply obliterated by this march to new forms of creativity. And uh, I, I mean, I like, I like that kind of mashup and, and um, you know, the, the recombinant culture as much as the next person. But I guess what I wonder is, and I'm, I'm only wondering, because I think maybe the ship has sailed, the, the kinds of things that I spend most of my time reading and thinking about and talking about with my students, they took 10 or 15 or 20 years to produce. You know, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit took him 15 years to write. Uh, he thought encapsulated thought. Uh, it wasn't 140 characters. Uh, it wasn't an idea. Uh, it was thought itself. Now, maybe that's ridiculous. Maybe that's something that belongs to another era. But if we don't ever even attempt that again, is, is there never going to be a philosopher again in human history who attempts to encapsulate thought? Well, I mean, if that's the future, that's what we've wrought, and we have to live with it. But I, for one, would think that counts as an impoverishment of human possibility. And insofar as all the attention goes to what you can do in 140 characters, uh, what room is there left for someone who wants to spend 15 years trying to think what thought is? But has that disappeared? Have we really lost? Who's going to publish that book now? Can't Candy self-publish it? <laughs> <laughs> he will have to self-publish it, yes. <laughs> On Kickstarter, yeah, you know? it'll be a Kickstarter project. That's exactly. <laughs> you know, right. what I see getting lost is, you know, I work for the Globe and Mail, and there are days where, you know, Syria gets bumped off the front page because they have a good picture of Lindsay Lohan. I mean, I think then you have a really distinct somebody's making those editorial choices, and and somebody's making those editorial choices with an eye to selling papers, maybe more than they used to. But but sorry, Johanna, to, just to push the point, it's mm -hmm. not just the fact of getting the book published; it's whether the book means anything to anyone mm -hmm. except him. Whoever, he or she, you know, the, the neo-Hegel, the Hegel of the 21st century, maybe in this audience. Uh, because n nobody cares about that. It's just another thing among things. It's just another blog post, only longer and more boring, you know? I mean, that's the problem. It's not that it can't be in the world. There's more stuff in the world now than there ever was. More books are published every year now than in the history of human civilization. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the book is thriving. It means that there, there's just many more opportunities to express yourself and fewer and fewer people who care that you do. Are, your, are kids still signing up for your class, though? Do you, do you have? Oh, sure, yeah. Well, it does, is that not encouraging <laughs> in and of it? Like, aren't they interested in reading about Hegel and what? No, they're interested in hearing about Hegel. They're not interested in reading <laughs> Hegel. <laughs> Can you sum up Hegel in 140 characters? <laughs> That's right. But so then what's the source of that problem? I mean, that's the nugget of the, 
the dumbing down question, right? Is it that there's uh, that no one is interested in reading the, in that depth? Is it that there's so much out there that things don't? You know, here's here's a hypothesis that I think it has some traction because it's not it's not value uh, laden. It's because. In my curmudgeonly voice, I would say, yes, it's dumbing down. But suppose the difference isn't that we were smarter before and we're dumber now and we're getting dumber in the future. It's that we care about different things. So on the analogy to, say, McDonald's versus your local diner that made a handcrafted hamburger. The McDonald's hamburger is worse from the point of view of someone who cares about the quality of the hamburger. But the convenience and the uniformity and the speed of the McDonald's hamburger are values that override any concern about that. So the fact that it's worse is no longer a problem for someone who values the McDonald's hamburger. So from that person's point of view, there's no net loss because that value isn't even in play. And I don't really care about the sort of notional possible quality of the hamburger. I care about these other things. And that's, that's where we're going with this. Right? It's that the, the kinds of things that we come to care about are different. So we're not getting dumber, we're getting different. But the things that we no longer care about are the things that some people used to care about, and they thought it made a difference. But those people are disappearing. No, I don't believe that. I mean, it, I, I, mean I don't want to. It sounds elitist, I guess. It is elitist. That's but, the whole point. <laughs> some, some things are better than other things. Who was reading Hegel? Smart people. 50s. Smarter people are reading Hegel. Okay, and who's reading it now? Smarter people. Yes. Smarter people. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, the fact that there are more people reading a wider variety of things, I don't know if that really changes that there is a certain number of people who are reading Hegel and that people can now access it and they but know about a, it and sorry. it's available for free online and they can download it. I mean, not, there's it's a, not a numbers game. It's not a numbers game. It's about whether it matters or not. But it yes, will... but there are the same people are, who are buying McDonald's one day. As, uh, you know, there's also like the artisanal Kobe beef you know, movement where we all need to have our handmade hammers in the Williamsburg flea market. Like there are, don't you find there are... I, I'm sorry, I didn't follow that at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a bunch Is of people... Hegel and heart artisanal cheese? Is no, that no, not Hegel. <laughs> the hammer. Didn't you say hammers? Yeah, oh, hamburger. Hammers. Yeah, I did say that. Um, the, people want the handmade stuff too. It's just these things now can coexist in it. Like, is it, is it possible that we don't have to have a hierarchical model? No. We have to. Well, we have to if we care about valuing things. I mean, this is, I guess, my point, is that everything is now coming down to a level, and that's, that's maybe the project that we want. Look, I'm, I'm trying to be as neutral as possible about this. I'm, I'm a philosophy professor. I'm clearly on the downslope of relevance. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, I just want to break a lance for the idea that some things are actually better than others and more valuable as a result of being better. And the fact that they're still around while all this other stuff is still around doesn't answer the point. It's whether they matter. And if going forward they matter and matter less, well, okay, that's, again, that's the future maybe we've wrought and maybe that's what we wanted when we democratized everything. But it's a net loss mm -hmm. in global historical terms. In terms of the history of civilization, that's a net loss. Mm -hmm. But is it, I mean, is it, does that get back to the idea that it was ever thus? I mean, was it really that different in Ray Barbary's time in the 1950s? Did Hegel matter to most the, people in that way? Sorry, I'm dominating this. So I, I, I just want to say the one last thing. I think by the, by the middle of the 20th century, the, the contours of our current situation were already clear. And the technological changes since 1957 and now are less important than the fact that there was this, uh, the idea of mass culture, mass cult, as, as uh, uh, Dwight MacDonald himself called it, came to dominate. So we're still working out the logic of that. It, it is certainly different if you go back 100 years or 200 years before that. Mm. Um, one of the things that really struck me about the book as I was reading it is the, the way that Bradbury depicts our media saturation is getting in the way of our relationship to nature. And I think that, for me, was very resonant, partly because we spend so much time you know, looking at our phones or whatever, or else nature becomes something that we fetishize by going to the farmer's market on the weekends or seeking out our, artisan, our artisanal beef. Um, did that resonate for anybody else, that idea of the, the disconnect from nature, the alienation from nature that maybe we feel now? You want to take this? 
<laughs> it's just me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, it is, it, it, I think maybe this is one of the weaknesses in the book that we were talking about, that, that there is, suddenly they need to escape, and it, it's not just the city that they need to escape, it's, it's that they need to sort of just get outside and look at a flower. I don't think that that is going to solve the kind of problems that we're talking about here. I mean, I think that everybody can sort of still agree that the mountains are great and the flowers are great and stuff. It's, it's in our kind of, you know, it's this information overload, the information processing, the information hierarchy is what you're talking about, that, that um, I think is trickier, don't you think? Yeah, I think I was thinking about it not so much in a valuing of uh, the mountains are great, but in that sense of like actually a more of a spiritual connection with mm -hmm. nature in, in, the, mm -hmm. in that sense. What, I think. what was interesting, I think, in that is that what he equated nature with, I think, was a kind of stillness. And this is what you're talking about a little bit. The, the, the time where nothing else is coming in, that you're sitting doing nothing. You know, I read something... God knows where, that um, if you sit and look in a limitless horizon, it actually releases endorphins in your body. Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing, that moment of contemplation, that all the time that we need to sit and think about something and let thoughts enter your head, you know, the, the fact that we won't allow our children to be bored, that you have to buy a minivan that has a TV set in it, or that you have to have an iPod on all the time. I look at kids on airplanes now, and they're hooked up in 10 different ways. They're never allowed to just sort of sit and look out the window with their own thoughts. And that is where I think, you know, does anybody just lie in the grass and stare at the sky anymore? That is the question that I think is a valued, valuable one. I was wondering when, when, um, when I reread the book if it wasn't just sort of an attempt to gauge with like a critique of industrialization and, you know, kind of try to bring that into the book. I, it seems that at the end he encounters these different people who present slightly different versions of, you know, the argument against mass media and hyper commercialization and, and the fire chief is one and Faber is the other and the people he encounters in the nature or nature outside of town as well. So I was, I was a little bit confused about what he was trying to say about that, but it did stand out, but I just, I'm not sure. Yeah. No, not when sure. you, yeah. but just, I'm, I guess I'm getting to an age where I worry about the next generation and because mm. you, um, research children's cultural practices. I wonder mm. if you have, are there things that you notice about their ability to do that kind of thing, to lie in the grass or? <laughs> yeah, or space for them to do that. Yeah, yeah uh, it's uh, definitely something that's lacking in a lot of children's lives, um, children who live in the city and children who live in suburbs as well. Um, a lack of opportunity to be in outdoor spaces and, and a lack of any opportunity to be unsupervised in outdoor spaces. So this idea of just lying in the grass is uh, definitely something that a lot of kids in, you know, again, Western privileged contexts or in, un, underprivileged contexts um, are not experiencing very often. Well, the devaluing of boredom, you know, yeah. boredom is incredibly mm -hmm. useful. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, it makes, it, it sort of gives you that little fallow period in which you launch into the next thing. Without that period of boredom, you, you know, how do you know who you are? I, like, I really feel like it's sort of in sitting, staring out the car window on thousands of family car trips that I became me, you know what I mean? And, and where, where is that? Is it just in what you like, 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 like? That's the... The, I, I think the boredom point is great because um, it, rem it reminds me of um, Adam Phillips, the psychoanalyst, defined boredom as the paradoxical wish for a desire, mm. which is a great way to put it because it sort of highlights the fact that what's lacking is the desire and what's not lacking is the desire for a desire. And it's in that structure of first and second order that that personhood resides. You know, and so we try to fill in the first order desire. If I lack one at a given moment, I try to somehow um, f f fill in that lack. But it's that lack that that is where the questions are asked. Uh, I can't I can't vouch for this personally, but a colleague of mine uh, has told me that in um, when he lived in Berlin in the U-Bahn, the underground, there was a sign that showed a a commuter who was sort of staring out the window, staring off into space, and the German caption was. Uh, Langweile ist der Ursprung des Philosophierens, uh, which means uh, boredom is the wellspring of philosophers. Uh, <laughs> and it's way. that, you know, the, the, best, the best philosophy seminar is the bus window, right? You're just sort of, yeah, why am I here? <laughs> why do I have no desires? What is it to have a desire? Well, who am I? What's going on? 
No, when do we get to Syracuse? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I'm with you, Johanna. That was my, my childhood philosophy tutorial, was, was those, those long car trips and no screen in front of my face. Mm. I want to leave some um, time and space for, for questions and comments. So just maybe at the end, I'll ask uh, all three of you, you know, is there a way that we can continue to, if not embrace, then swim in the media world that we live in while protecting the self for that quiet space of reflection? Are those things capable of being balanced? I think it's just a question of not allowing, like I was doing today, not allowing yourself to become too caught up in it. And that is a, is a matter of discipline. And I think also education. I think that you have to, you know, this is what they go to university for. I think they, they, they just, you're sort of stripped down to your nub. You are taught that every thought you've ever had, someone had better than you millions of times before. And there's something in that kind of, you know, stripping you down the, the, where you start again. And I think the only way to do that is through not letting yourself be overwhelmed all the time by all this stuff. And that is just a matter of rigor. And, and that, I know that's a lot easier said than done. <laughs> but, um, you know, limiting, limiting the amount of time that you're swimming in the gook. You can't ignore it, but you can try to stay out of it sometimes. Same question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, that's a very good answer. I mean, looking for the balance and giving yourself space and saying to yourself that it's okay to not be connected. I guess um, one of the big problems that my students talk to me about is feeling like they have to be. There's peer pressure, but also a sense that employers are going to expect them to have an online profile. And, you know, in my class, they have to join the Facebook group. And there's this feeling that it's never okay to be disconnected. So this idea of not having a cell phone would be you know, not even a possibility, but introducing that and, and giving yourself freedom and permission, I guess, to, to turn it off. The only thing I think is very good, um, the only thing I would add is uh, maybe the most important thought to my mind about media and technology generally is to resist the, the easy and, in fact, nonsensical idea that t technology is neutral or that media are neutral. We can use them for good or for bad. Every technology, every medium has tendencies. It has constraints and limits that make it tendentious. It allows certain things but not others. And every time somebody says, oh, you know, Twitter is neutral, Facebook is neutral, it could be the Arab Spring, it could be, you know, um, sending photos of date rape, no. That those things are true, but that doesn't make it neutral. And the most important thing is to be critical about the media that we engage in at that level and absolutely resist and shout down, frankly, anybody who's, who says neutral. Okay, thank you very much to our panelists.